So our topic is the shrewd manager from Luke chapter 16. It's a story, it's a parable, and it challenges us to think about money and wealth. Oh joy, I hear you say. Uh, some of you perhaps left already, I don't know. Because we're not comfortable about talking about money always, are we? I know in some marriages, couples don't talk about money. It's too sensitive a subject. So I'm uh, not sure what chance we have as a church. But Martin alluded to the fact that Jesus did in fact talk a lot about money. If you look through the Gospels, there's lots of places where there's talk about wealth and greed and money, that whole topic area. Jesus talks about it more than a lot of other subjects. Uh, there's the story of the rich young ruler. Um, there's parables about farmers storing up wealth and then they die. There's the challenge of the widow giving her might at the temple offering. And there's that amazing story of Zacchaeus turning around, having dis mishandled all his money and giving it back. So if it mattered to Jesus, because he talks about it a lot, I think as followers of his, it should matter to us too. So hopefully as we explore this passage together, a few pennies might drop, if you'll excuse the pun. Okay, this week's been an interesting week as far as money goes. We've seen the launch of the new pound coin. Okay, so forget Brexit, forget Article 50. The big news this week is the new pound coin. Although I guess Brexit means we won't have to adopt the euro, so it's futures insured a little bit. Um, I've been trying to get one all week. I thought if I'm going to use a pound coin as a visual aid, I need to have one. But I've not got one yet. Has anyone else seen one? Not in the offering yet, Dawn? No? Okay. Well, they're coming. So uh, they, they've got this sort of security hologram type thing in them where if you sort of, depending on what angle you hold it, you can see a pound symbol or a, a number one. So I'm told. That's why I want to see one, to see what it's like. So the days of the round pound are gone. It's giving Tesco a few challenges with their trolleys, isn't it? Um, and the challenge for us is that all those coins that we have lost down the sofa, or I'll keep a few in the glove box in the car just in case I get caught at the parking meter, or who knows how many are in your piggy banks, we've got to trade them in before the 15th of October. Um, so. If, if you get nothing else out of this sermon, there's a little tip for you. Go home and check, check your piggy banks, because you're bound to have some lurking. But why? Why do we have all these new coins? We've just had new fivers as well. We're getting used to those. There's new £10 notes coming out. Why? Well, apparently, it's because the pound coin particularly has been, is getting easier to counterfeit I'm told that 3% of pound coins that we have in circulation are fakes. Now, 3% doesn't sound much, but if you count them up, that's about 45 million coins. So that's 45 million quid is fake. So that's a lot of dodgy money. And I guess people are counterfeiting money because there's that desire to have more. They want to spend it. They want to get richer. They want to own more. Uh, but in reality, people are being dishonest. They're being fraudulent, they're cheating, they're ripping us off. And, uh, and that's why the Royal Mint have gone to all this trouble of creating some new coins. And in our parable, if we could have the next slide please, we have this story of the shrewd manager. And in this parable we also find dishonesty and fraud and cheating. This manager is basically cooking the books, isn't he? And it, straight away in verse 1, we find out that he's been dishonest and he's accused of wasting his owner's possessions. And so he's given the sack and he's told to work his notice. Now I have to say, if I'd been the rich owner, I'd have shown in the door at that point. I wouldn't have wanted left him hanging around. I have to say, I've had to do that a couple of times in my career and it's not a nice thing to do. But sometimes you have to do it. But no, this rich owner allows him to work his notice and so the manager thinks oh good I've got an opportunity during my notice period to make some friends and it's a clever plan it might be a dishonest plan but it's not a stupid plan is it he gets to work and he calls in some people 
who owe his master some money or wheat or olive oil, various things, and he cuts a deal with them. Now, the first one owed him 800 gallons. I think in your translation it was 900. In some translations it talks about measures and things. So it varies a little bit depending on how, how it's translated. But we probably don't need to get too hung up with the actual numbers themselves. What we need to understand is that these are pretty big numbers. 800 gallons of olive oil is quite a lot. Um, and basically he's offering this first guy 50% off. So he says, give me 400 gallons, we'll call it a deal. And then the next guy comes in, and he owes 1,000 bushels of wheat. And he says, well, let's call that 800. So he gets a 20% discount. He perhaps didn't know about the discount the first guy got, but <laughs> he goes away seemingly happy. So what's he doing, this servant? Well, basically he's saying, well, while I've still got a job, I'm going to curry some favour with people who owe my master money, whether that's money, oil, wheat, whatever, so that when I'm out of a job, when I'm shown the door, there'll be people out there who I can turn to for help. I'll have somewhere to go, someone to fall back on when I need it. So that was his logic, I think. That's what this servant was thinking. Now, again, if I'd have been the rich ruler, I'd have been spitting feathers at this point. I mean, I was expecting 800 gallons of olive oil and I've only got 400. I've been ripped off. We don't like getting ripped off, do we? Even when we get short change in the supermarket, we like to go back and complain. And given that there's a lot of big numbers involved here, you'd have thought the manager would have been banging his head against the wall thinking, well, why on earth did I let this guy stay on? Why didn't I do something different? But no, instead he's impressed. And if we could have the next slide, that the, the text it says the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. I don't know, maybe the rich owner was a dishonest guy as well. Maybe he, wish, maybe he was jealous and wished he'd have come up with such a, a good plan like that. I don't know. So what is interesting in this passage is that Jesus goes on a little bit to explain the story. He doesn't always do that, does he, Jesus? And as I explored this passage and unpacked it a little bit, and thought about what Jesus is saying, I came to appreciate that there were two sides to money. Now you take our pound coin again, it's going to keep popping up. Uh, our pound coin, any coin, doesn't have to be a pound coin, it has two sides, doesn't it? And we have that saying that there are two sides to the coin. And I think it's true of money and of wealth. It's a funny thing, isn't it, money, when you think about it? We all need it. There's rent to pay. There's food to buy, we can give it away, we can try and make the world a better place with it. And yet it also has this strange and powerful influence over us. Even when we're playing a game of Monopoly, we like to get that little bit more. It somehow has this hold over us that we always want to acquire a bit more. So if we could have the next slide. So on the one side, money can be seen as a bad thing. I don't mean necessarily the Queen's a bad thing, that's just the fact the Queen's got two sides and she's on one side, so that's the way it goes. But look again at verse 9. Jesus talks about worldly wealth and unrighteous mammon, as it says in some of the older translations. So we're getting this sense that money is not necessarily a good thing. I think if you look at the uh, original Greek, I'm no Greek expert, but apparently the word, the word that's translated worldly or unrighteous is adikos. And apparently that's quite a strong term. So there's a suggestion here that Jesus isn't mincing his words when he's talking about worldly wealth and unrighteous mammon. Money is worldly. It is unrighteous. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's certainly not benign. It's certainly not harmful, harmless. Um, you know, you just ask a gambler if you want some evidence of that. Um, it can be dangerous and harmful. So let's not kid ourselves that, well, money, well, it's just a neutral thing. It's a necessary evil. It's just a medium of exchange. Look around the world. We've seen money corrupting. We've seen it used to bribe people. 
We see it used to bully. We see it used to keep people in line. You can use it to buy influence. You can use it to buy honour, buy privilege. And I could go on. Money is used in so many ways that it is arguably one of the most powerful things in our world. Some of you may, may remember the headlines around cash for questions and cash for honours. Just one example, as this newspaper headline illustrates, of how money can, can be used to, uh, to buy power and honour. I read one Christian writer, he described money in this way, as an active agent, a law unto itself, capable of inspiring devotion. And I think that's partly why Jesus talks in verse 13 about the fact that we can't serve both God and money, because he understood money, that's why he talked about it so much, but he also understood the power that money can have over us, the way it can hook us in, the way it can win our hearts, the way it can lead us to be greedy, to the point where we idolise it. I think even Karl Marx described money as a visible divinity because of the way people worship it. So what does Jesus say in verse 13? He says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now you might think that's a bit strong, a bit extreme, a bit too black and white. Surely we're sensible grown-up people, we can handle money. But Jesus is clear about, in his mind anyway, about the detrimental effect that money can have on us. And so he presents his listeners, and I think he presents us too with his stark choice, that we've got to either serve God or we've got to serve money. If you're still not convinced, think about it for a minute. Most of us will let money make the decisions for us. Money decides how big a house we can afford or rent. How much we put aside for that holiday might mean we go to Skegness or have three weeks in Bali. The type of car we drive. Yes, some of us will stretch, maybe take out a loan, but even if we're thinking we don't have enough money, it's still money that's making the decisions around what we buy and what we do. I know I did it this week, only at work. I heard myself saying, well, we can't afford to do such and such because the budget wasn't big enough. But, there's a big but, but if you turn that on its head and you serve God instead of money, then the whole perspective changes. And I think that's what Jesus is challenging us to do here, to trust God to provide for us, to let him make our money decisions, turn the economics over to him, then we're serving God and not money. When we started... Some of you will know this, but uh, the church I'm involved in in Northampton, a little few years ago now, I was in charge of a redevelopment project. It's not the best of pictures, this, but it just gives you a little glimpse of what our church looks like these days. Um, and we had nowhere near enough money to start this project, um, but we felt God was calling us to redevelop our church. We worked out what we needed to do, and it was going to cost us nearly a quarter of a million pounds to redevelop our church. And we had 25 grand. So that wasn't going to go very far. But you see, had money made the decision for us, we wouldn't have even started that project. We'd have stopped at that point. But we felt God wanted us to do it. So we took our 25 grand and we stepped out in faith. And miraculously, God provided the rest. That's a story for another day, perhaps. So we flip the coin now. Let's see the other side of the pound coin. We're starting to see money in a more positive way. And this is the good news. If we can take on board the fact that money, it isn't a neutral thing, that it has the potential to be harmful and dangerous, that we can get to the point where we idolise it, 
often without even realising it. If we get that into perspective, then, and I think only then, can we begin to master it. We can begin to steward it. We can start to use it rather than serve it. We let God guide us in its use and look to him for direction. Let's remind ourselves again of what it said in verse 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends. Yes, worldly wealth may not always be good, but we can use it for the glory of God. And I think this is the centerpiece of what Jesus is saying here. I think sometimes we overcomplicate this parable and we try and read too much into it. Jesus is basically teaching money, we should be using it. We should be good stewards of wealth and the things that we have. And I think, too, we should use it, and this is important as well, we should use it in a way that it can bring eternal significance and benefit. Because as the saying goes, we can't take it with us when we go, like the money goes back in the box. We can't take it with us. So what we've got, let's put that to good effect so that it furthers God's kingdom. Just a couple of points, just to sort of, on the other side as it were, I don't think here Jesus is saying we can be dishonest in our handling of money. Some people say, well, he has, is, you know, this is a dishonest servant. So if a dishonest servant, that, that, isn't that an excuse that we can be dishonest? raking some extra funds for the church, for the building program or whatever. No, I don't think Jesus is saying that. At no point in this parable does he commend the steward's dishonesty. And if you read elsewhere in the Bible, I don't think that would, that would marry up. And also as Christians, sometimes we can risk going to the opposite extreme. We sort of get this message that, okay, money's a bad thing. Jesus says money's bad. It's unrighteous. So we ignore it, we avoid it, we put our head in the sands. And I don't think, you know, we have that logic that money, bad, avoid. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying don't run from it or put your head in the sand. Master it. Be good stewards. Use it. And there's lots of ways we can use money. I just put a few examples on the slide there from different organisations, and we talked about two of them this morning. There's a great need in Africa at the moment. And, you know, that could be giving money to that cause could be the difference between someone living and someone dying. I'm not going to tell you this morning how to use your money. That's between you and God. But I think often God calls us to use our money to invest in people. And I don't mean about getting the shiny plaque on the wall that you're an investor in people, but to benefit the lives of people, whether that's spiritually or practically, like helping people in Africa. There's lots of good causes. You know, we've, we know the benefit of digging wells. Uh, some of us will sponsor children. There's still a place, of course, for investing in buildings and bricks and mortar sometimes. But the point is, we can use this money to make a difference in people's lives. Because if we spend it on the right things, it can be powerful in a positive way. Bill Gates is a, a great philanthropist. Is that the right word? He's got a lot of money and he gives it away, basically. He gave $28 billion away, I think, in 2013. That was the last figure I could find. And he puts it into healthcare and education and stuff. Now, we're not going to have, well, I certainly not going to have $28 billion to give away. But that's not a reason to say, well, it doesn't apply to me. I've got some money. Why don't I use that for God's work? Do something useful with it. Okay. Let me, let me apply this a little bit. Um... Because it's not easy, this passage. So let, let me just give you four things to think about and take away in light of this story that Jesus told. Four practical actions uh, to go away and do. Right at the start, I said that Jesus says a lot about money, and this is just one passage. Um, he goes far beyond this passage in Luke. So why not study the Bible? Why not see what else Jesus teaches about money, what he's saying. There's often a tendency, I think, to go, 
oh, we've got it all sussed. We're Christians. We, we can handle our money. It doesn't apply to us. It's all those greedy people out there that God needs to speak to. You know, very often money makes us blind to its effect on us. I know in my own life I'm no saint. I don't always get it right with my handling of money, and God needs to challenge me sometimes. So let's not, you know, let's wake up to the reality of, you know, we don't always get it right. And let's study the Bible and see what it teaches us about how we should handle money and wealth. And then I suggest you pray about it. God doesn't mind us talking to him about what we do with our money. In fact, I think he would welcome it if we did it more often. What you have, what you give, your attitude, do you serve it or do you use it? Ask God to be involved in those decisions around money. I was challenged a few weeks ago when I was reading a book um, about this. Because very often, don't we as Christians, we sort of think, okay, I'm blessed with some money. How much of that money should I give to God? And many of us sort of use 10% as a bit of a guide as to how much we should give. And I'm, I'm, I don't decry that. There's, there's merit in that. Then I was reading this book that talked about God's ownership. And how, in fact, God owns the money. Interesting, in our parable, the steward, he wasn't mishandling his own money, was he? He was mishandling his owner's money. It wasn't even his in the first place. And if you, now's not the time to go into a lot of theology about God's ownership of things. You'll be pleased to know. Um, but it does make you think a bit differently. Because if God owns everything, then it's not a case of saying, well, how much of my money should I give to God? It's a case of saying, well, how much of God's money should I keep for myself? That's quite a powerful question when you think about it like that, isn't it? How much of God's money should I keep for myself? And that challenged me as I was thinking and praying about money. Um, and I've clearly got some work to do, so uh, I'll let you know how I get on with that. And then the third thing, manage your money. If you're not great at managing your money, try some budgeting takes practice and you probably won't get it right the first time but you know what they say practice makes perfect so think about what you're spending if you don't know take time to work it out determine to be better stewards of your money and if you're good at managing money because some of us are then maybe you can help someone who's not we're all in this together so maybe you could offer some advice to someone else I know my wife, she's got a friend who has not got a clue when it comes to managing money. Not a clue at all. And so she's been trying to just offer some advice and some help, which is not an easy task. But we can, we can support each other in that. And then if you want to get serious, if you really want to get serious about not idolising money, then the fourth thing you should do is try giving more of it away. No, you probably don't want to hear that advice. But, uh, and I don't advocate you give it all away because that can be counterproductive. But giving is often a blessing, not just to others, but ourselves. So I think that's another thing about the other side of the coin. If we use money in a positive way and we give it over to God, then that benefits our relationship with God. And so ironically, the very thing that sort of rivals God starts to enhance our relationship with him because we're doing, using it in the way that he wants us to. We learn to trust him more. We learn to get closer to him. We depend on him more for our future and our security. One last example. I was, uh, when our kids were young, I bought them nice new bikes. And... Uh, and uh, they used them, and they got the benefit out of them, and then they grew, grew out of them, and I had still had, yeah, they were quite in good nick, so I thought, well, well, we'll sell these bikes, we'll make a few quid selling these bikes. So I put some ads up in the local shops, and uh, no one seemed to want to buy them, so I put the price down a bit, and I thought, I'll tell you what, eBay. I'm bound to sell them on eBay. So I thought, well, if I get at least 30 quid for them, that'd be nice. So... Uh, thought about putting these bikes on eBay. Meanwhile, my wife, unbeknown to me, because she's good at this sort of thing, 
She knew someone who came along to the toddler group who didn't have much money and whose daughter wanted a bike. And I'm like, no, nah, 30 quid in my pocket, please. I don't want to give the bike away. But she was insistent. And in the end, I gave in and uh, we took the bike round to this, to this girl. Now, reflecting on that, what gave me more joy? The 30 pound in my pocket or the smile on that girl's face from having a new bike? can make a difference, even only small things. Let me finish with a quote from the great reformer Martin Luther. He said, there are three conversions necessary. The conversion of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and the purse. Now, I'm not sure if that's quite theologically true. We might want to debate that. But you get the point, don't you? That the money matters. And yeah, it can be uncomfortable to talk about it. Uh, but you know, if we're serious about following Jesus, um, I think last time I hear, Martin, you were talking about the need to be committed in our walk with Jesus and how that affects all areas of our lives. And one area of our life that it affects too is our money, our purses. So I know that's not been an easy thing to think about, but hopefully it's given you some food for thought. Go away and have a think about how we use our money. <coughs> Study it more, pray about it. If you don't already, do some budgeting. And maybe there's a challenge to give more of it away. Amen. I was thinking of a, a song to sing in response to that. And uh, I came up with an old hymn. I don't always like choosing old hymns because I do like some of the more modern ones. But this song did say it all for me. It's, about, it's a song of commitment. They're not words that you can sing lightly. But it talks about commitment to God and there is a verse in there that says take my silver and my gold not a mite is it would I withhold so they're quite challenging so think about those words as you sing them and we'll finish with this song together thank you mm -hmm.